Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is researching bioenergy or subtle energy. My guest is Wagner Allegretti, who is one of the co-founders with Nancy Trivellato of the International Academy of Consciousness. They have a beautiful campus located in Portugal. Wagner is originally from Brazil. He is also author of a book called Retrocognition, and he has conducted extensive research that we'll be talking about today. Welcome, Wagner. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to be Likewise. with you. You showed me some of your research findings yesterday. They're really quite extraordinary, and we'll be sharing them today with our viewers. But let's begin with how you define bioenergy. Well, I think this is one of the hardest things to do, to define bioenergy. But I think we can start with some synonyms, other expressions people use for that. So, throughout time, people have called this chi, argon, many times uh, subtle energy, life force, animal magnetism. In fact, there are more than 100 different synonyms for that. People have this idea of a kind of a life field, a life force, something that gives life to the physical body. But also I see that, let us call bioenergy from this point on, as a domain tool for the consciousness. If we think of consciousness as something beyond the brain, body, matter, energy, time, it's very difficult for us to think how consciousness would interact with the physical body, with the physical brain. It seems this sort of life field, this bioenergy, would be the bridge, the interface between the consciousness and the physical body. But many people have heard about bioenergy in phenomena like, or phenomena like uh, healing or poltergeist, PK, telekinesis, and things like that. But I think this goes much beyond that, because I think bioenergy is, in fact, a very important key, a part in the nature or the structure of reality. Well, I gather one of the key ingredients of uh, this particular form of bioenergy of most interest to you is that it can be directed through conscious intention. Exactly. So, all life or life forms, living things, they are alive because of this bioenergy. But this bioenergy so works, is, be, is being absorbed, transformed, applied in a kind of uh, unconscious way. So, it's a natural process that goes by itself. So, we are alive here, in part, because we are absorbing, transforming, and even emitting this form of energy. But it's possible for us to be aware of this energy, to sense it, and to control it. So, to simplify, we can train ourselves to acquire these two basic abilities, to sense, to feel energy, and to control it. Some people are born with this kind of uh, sensitivity. Some people can apply energy even if they don't have too much control of that. But throughout the years, in so many decades working with this, we have noticed that some people, they are born with this kind of ability, but others never felt this. And in fact, this is my case. I started having my autobot experiences when I was young, about nine years old. I used to have this that is called a vibrational state. I could feel this very powerful vibration inside of my body. It was already a manifestation of this form of energy, but I didn't know how to provoke, to control that. Throughout the years, you know, with contact with so many people, reading, meeting healers, mediums, 
Little by little, I learned that we can control this. So, nowadays, I can feel energy many times from people, different places, trees, sometimes even in my sightseeing. When I go in tourism, I already apply this kind of enrichment of my experience because you can feel the energy of different places. But then, when we learn how to really control this energy, you can help other people, you can cleanse the energies of a particular place, and uh, even more, you can have uh, a better degree of control of your out-of-body experiences. Because it seems this subtle body that we have, uh, some people like to call it the astral body, the psychosome, and so many other different names, mm -hmm. is glued to the physical body through this kind of field. So think of that as a kind of magnetic field that keeps the astral body inside of the physical body. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this energy body that we have is really to sustain life. But if we learn how to control this energy body, we learn how to detach the psychosoma from the body. And vibrational state is one of the ways for that. But also, for instance, in terms of our health, if we absorb more energy, we can improve our health. We can have more vitality. So sometimes when I feel I have a little bit of a, an illness, could be a flu or a cold, if I absorb more natural energy, I can expedite the whole process of uh, you know, the, the healing, the recovery of the physical body. Well, I suppose it's important to clarify for our viewers, since you use the term magnetic, we're not really talking about electromagnetism. Exactly, we are not. So this is a different form of energy. In fact, I think it is good for us to clarify this. We use the word energy just to simplify the whole thing, because this kind of uh, factor in life sometimes manifests more like a force, sometimes like a fluid, many times as energy because it can produce some work, but many times it's more like uh, information. So I think what we call bioenergy, in fact, is a different kind of uh, physical or paraphysical entity in this world because this form of energy can carry information with it, information in many cases that comes from us. So that's why many times people say, oh, the vibes in that place were really good. Oh, the vibes in that other situation were really bad. So what do we say is good energy or bad energy, in fact, relates more to the information that is there. Like, for instance, some spaces, places, they can have a kind of a memory of things that happened there, being good or bad. Sometimes we get close to some people and we feel that person communicates a kind of a field of uh, something pleasant. It makes you feel more alive. It settles your emotions. But sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes when we get close to some people, they make us much worse yes. than we were before. Yeah. So it's important for us to know, for instance, how to defend ourselves from this kind of uh, energy contagion, for instance. And I guess it's also fair to say that aside from the work of a, a few people, such as yourself, this form of energy isn't really recognized by science yet. Oh, certainly not. Because we lack technology to measure, to detect this. And the example I used to, to, to use in these discussions is like electricity. We have always had electricity in nature, in ourselves, throughout the whole existence of us. But only more recently is when we could start measuring, detecting, noticing, you know, manifestations, effects of electricity. And then we developed means, devices, to measure electricity. So we are in, at the, this transition now. Bioenergy is part of nature, but we still don't have reliable ways of measuring that. That's exactly where I want to work and to see if I can make a difference there. Now, you began by telling me that as a child, I think you said nine years old, yes. you, you had out-of-body experiences. You grew up in Brazil, yes. a country which, in, in my experience, Brazilians are very open by yes. and large to these things. Most of them, yes. Spiritualism is, is rampant yes. in, in Brazil, and you became prior to your present phase of, of work with the International Academy of Consciousness, you, you were involved with a very prominent Brazilian spiritual teacher and researcher, Waldo Vieira, yes. who, who was a spiritualist medium. Exactly, exactly. Before him, I was 
being part of many different spiritualist groups in Brazil, yoga, Sama, you know, Eastern traditions. So I was really trying to pursue to find any kind of information that could help me to understand what was, what was going on with me. And then in 1982, I met Valdo Vieira. I was at the beginning of my you know, university there. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, is, what was interesting is that I noticed that Valdo was having a more technical, scientific approach to that. That attracted my my attention. And I worked with him for many years until we split because of some difference of positions, you know, more like a political ones mm -hmm. on this. But then certainly the base of that is the same. So like the, the consciousness being multidimensional, you know, we are more than the physical body. And what is important to say that I think it is useful for a lot of people is that a lot of people still think that you have to be born with these abilities. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the chance of having these experiences. And it is not exactly like that. It's like asking if, if everybody can play piano. Well, perhaps some people are going to have more talent. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, with a few lessons, the person is going to be there playing like, you know, a composer there. Mm -hmm. Other people might need more time. But it's exactly the same thing with us. If we, if we get information, if we apply our time, our, our effort in practicing, all of us can learn how to leave the body, how to control energy. But also, I think it's important that the understanding of this can really help us to go deeper on this kind of practice. Otherwise, we get too much on the surface of it. That's exactly my thing, because I have always been the kind of, uh, you know, technical guy, dismantling everything and anything at home. Inventing things, you know, creating short circuits <laughs> in my home to the despair of my mother there. And I got into university to study electrical engineering. And I always thought that it was, there, there had to be a way of putting that kind of uh, reality of my out of body experience, the lucid dreams, and the, the technical engineering physics part together. Mm -hmm. Because many times people see these two things as being incompatible, separate. But the universe, is one. So these are just manifestations of the human mind trying to understand reality. And I think they can be put together there. So throughout these years, leaving the body, for instance, many times I saw in other realities, in other dimensions, technology, devices that were working or used this form of bioenergy, mm -hmm. things that we still don't have here. So in some particular levels of reality, you see a kind of technology that is a lot more advanced than the one we have here. So it's up to us now to see if we can invent and discover that. I think everything starts with the concept of a transducer, mm -hmm. something that can transform one form of energy into another one. It's like the microphone here. gets the mechanical vibration of our voice and translates that into electricity or variation of some electrical properties there. And then you can amplify these, you can record. And we have also the speakers. They do the opposite. So you get electricity there, no changing, mm -hmm. and you get sound. So we have to discover a transducer for the bioenergy. Can we get a device that would get bioenergy and then can translate this into electricity or changes in the electricity? And perhaps the opposite. And then certainly we can create a whole no nope. technology based on that. Well, since you brought up the analogy of the microphone and the loudspeaker, it reminded me that the man who invented the loudspeaker, among many other inventions, was Sir Oliver Lodge, who was a great researcher into spiritualism exactly. and, and this whole area. Exactly. There are always these fascinating connections l like that. L let's now talk about the actual uh, experimental research you've engaged in. Yes. So I think it was when I started uh, studying at the university, I thought, look, can some of these you know, sensitive devices that are you know, used by scientists in labs, uh, can they detect this form of bioenergy? So then with my access to some labs in the university, I tried to see if I could affect you know, some magnetometers, Geiger counters, some very sensitive uh, semiconductor transducers for electrical things. Well, to my power of energy, I could not make any, create any change, in re any result with that. 
And I devised many different properties there or devices using those properties, no result. And then I got back and thought, look, life is already the natural transducer to bioenergy. The body is really transmutating or changing this bioenergy in this physical expression that we have here. But I didn't want to use living things, you know. I didn't want to put wires, you know, in plants or in animals because of uh, ethical concerns, of course, but also because you cannot rely on those things as being stable enough because the life itself is so dynamic. Some, uh, you know, living things, they have own, their own behavior. So we would never know if those results will be a result of our own bioenergy or the internal processes of those things there. But then I thought, well, what are the basic you know, building blocks of life? Some form of carbohydrates, this or that, but mostly protein. Mm -hmm. Proteins are a class of substances. They are so dynamic, so, you know, varied. They can be building blocks for the construction of the body, but they can be catalysts as, as enzymes to some chemical reactions. And uh, I thought, look, let, us, let me try to use a formal, a common form of protein like collagen that is very easy for us because it's basically the gelatin that we eat. So I get, you know, pharmaceutical grade Collagen, I made some, uh, you know, gels there, and I put some electrodes inside of that, that gel in a kind of a you know, disc like this, and I measured some of the electrical characteristics of that. Basically, at first, it was just the electrical resistance of that, something easy for us to measure with any cheap instrument. And then I start submitting that to bioenergy with myself, some healers, some other people. And sometimes, not every time, I noticed a variation of the electrical resistance there. So I think that my hypothesis was right. So mm -hmm. our energy field can change something in the proteins, so perhaps the shape of it, because the 3D structure of the protein is very important mm -hmm. for so many reactions we have in our physical body, for instance. Perhaps this change, they would also change the the electrical conductivity of those proteins there. And then for a long while, I had to stop that because of giving classes and traveling. But more recently, uh, the last 10 years, I thought of using functional MRI because I wanted to know what changes in the brain when we work with energy. Because the neuron, I think, is the best transducer we have. So when I do something like this, it's me as a consciousness, not as the body, controlling the brain to create this. There has to be something special in the neuron that receives this bioenergy information and translates into electricity or you know, changes in our, in our chemistry here. So with some contacts, connections, friends, I got the opportunity to work with some of these you know, MRI machines but instead of using them just to get an anatomical view of the body, a static, like an X-ray, you no, know, in a way, if you will, to get an information about the structure of the body, there is this variant, the function MRI, mm -hmm. that, that shows which areas of the brain are more active as we engage into some particular behaviors. So you can make some mental calculation. You can try to remember something that was very emotional to you. You can meditate and then... This technique will show which areas of the brain are more active there. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, what would happen when we try to absorb energy, when we create the vibrational state? So I ran many, many, many experiments like that. And then I noticed then when I got into the vibrational state, that is something that I can produce at will, mm -hmm. many areas of the brain, they lit up. Not only a particular area, but the whole brain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... The instrument there, the machine showed lights or the signal per se, the bold signal as it is called, out of my skull. And this shouldn't happen at all. Well, let's talk for a moment about how the MRI works. Magnetic resonance imagery is yes. MRI. So it's got to detect something that responds to uh, magnetic fluctuations in, in the body or in the brain, if you're imaging your head, which would be the hemoglobin. Yes. 
the hemoglobin in the blood. So, what you're really looking at is uh, increases or decreases of, of blood flow and flow exactly different areas of the brain. So, if you're showing a response outside of your head completely, and we can show our viewers the exactly. image, yes. the images of this, why well, certainly there's no hemoglobin splattering around outside your head. Exactly. So, yeah, as you can imagine, when I showed this to radiologists, medical doctors, and physicists, some of them said, or most of them said, there was a mistake here. This is a fluke. This is an artifact. There was some problem with acquisition of image. Perhaps you moved your head as you were doing these experiments. I said, I guarantee you didn't move my head. I tried this so many times. And I said, look, if I, when I was there inside of the machine, just relaxed, these things didn't happen. But as I engage in my internal thinking, using my will to move energy, these things appeared. But then, as you can imagine, I tried to isolate all these factors, but I tried, for instance, a bottle of water that is the ghost or the phantom of the function MRI. They use this just as a very simple thing to calibrate the machine. They put this bottle there inside of the machine instead of the head of the person, and then they can adjust the sensitivity gain and so many different things to know everything is working right. And in one of my experiments, I put that bottle there and we ran many sequences showing that everything was there behaving as it should be. Mm. But then, when I was emitting energy to that bottle, some light, the bold signal, appeared inside of the bottle of water there. Mm -hmm. So this couldn't be the bottle moving. This couldn't be just the bottle getting anxious or creating too much of an expectation, mm -hmm. <laughs> as they told it could be the case with the brain, with a person there. Mm -hmm. After some time, I thought of using something more organic. In instead of being just water, putting a chicken egg there inside. And I still consider this to be the best result so far. Mm -hmm. So, I ran many sequences with the egg there. Egg no. in the bottle? Is that how it No, went? no, just egg. I took the bottle out mm -hmm. inside of that kind of... Uh, you know, cage. the cage there that go, goes around the, of our head. I put just the egg there sitting there by itself. Okay. So, as you run the function MRI there, first a normal MRI just to get the structure there, you can see the yolk, you can see the internal structure, but nothing is special there, no bolt signal. And then I did a sequence like this, about a minute without doing anything, another minute with me sending, transmitting energy, like if I were healing the egg, and another minute without doing anything. So, what happened there? So, during this first minute, the machine is working there with all that noise and the, Im the images there just gray without anything. I was inside of the room of the function MRI there, behind the machine, but not inside of that big coil, mm -hmm. exactly to avoid any kind of interference, because somebody could say that my hands moved, altered the magnetic field in some way, so I was very careful with that. But then when I got the instruction, and we can, can hear this in the video, start. So then I start pumping, you no know, sending energy, not with the physical movement, just mentally. And then after a few seconds, because all the computing effect imposed a kind of delay of five, six seconds there, and then you start seeing this glow of uh, light, it's just a representation of the natural magnetic resonance of the protons there inside of, of that egg changing. Because this machine creates a big, powerful magnetic field, put all the protons pointing in the same direction, and then the machine pumps some extra electromagnetic energy there to see if they can deviate that for a while, how long it takes to come back to that. Mm -hmm. So, this is the magnetic resonance. So, in some way, this that we call bioenergy changes this behavior. So, this is a quantum effect. This is the spin of the protons there. This is not a microscopic behavior like uh, changing temperature or pressure. It's something there really at the core of uh, the structure of matter. But then returning to the description of experiment, all this bold signal gets stronger and stronger. And then after about a minute, my friend tells me, stop. And then without any movement, staying exactly in the same position, I stop pumping energy. After a few seconds, you can see the bolt signal reducing until it disappears. Mm -hmm. So, certainly we need more people 
repeating this kind of experiment to be sure this is a kind of universal phenomenon happens to different people in different machines, different places. But I repeated this many times, getting the same result. So this shows to me that we can change some kind of internal intrinsic property of matter there. Certainly, this is nothing new to us because I have seen cases of poltergeist, things moving, things catching fire spontaneously. So I didn't need that to prove this reality to me. That was not the point. But I wanted to see if I could devise a kind of experiment that would help other people, skeptical people, to see something that can be repeated, can be controlled, that would show really the human mind, the intention, can drive some form of energy or field that can change the structure of matter. Now, there have been many experiments in psychokinesis affecting uh, the widest variety of instrumentation, uh, of often random event generators, quantum yes, mechanical yes. random event generators seem to be particularly sensitive. Is there in your mind a distinction between psychokinesis and the conscious movement of bioenergy? No. I think they are basically essentially the same. What happens many times with some people is that they don't feel the energy they are pumping out. They feel only the intention of doing something. But I think it is the same thing. Something, a field, if you will, centered on that particular consciousness, affects the whole universe. To which extent, we don't know. Many times we have the combination of many different people, many different consciousnesses, aligning to a very particular purpose. So, I have read of uh, experiments in which people could change, for instance, the pattern of crystallization of some substances, the surface tension of water, some magnetic effects, and uh, movements, of course, you know, sometimes even in an isolated chamber. But I think th this energy can change many different properties of matter, but then perhaps some of them would require a big power, amount of energy. To move something yeah. requires a lot of energy, so perhaps this is not something that everybody would be able to do. What I'm trying to see is if I can, if I can get, if we can devise a way to measure by bioenergy, even if it is not that intense, mm -hmm. to get more sensitivity to that particular device in a way that would work with everyone, anyone. The way I see, we will have uh, in the future something like the tricorder of Star Trek yeah. that we can go around mm -hmm. and measure the bioenergy of a particular place, a tree, you know, a cat, even to use for medicine. Can we measure the, the overall vitality of someone, even if that person is not intentionally pumping energy there? Because our whole planet, life, and people, they combine it there, they overlap their own fields of energy there. Well, you've trained, I'm guessing, thousands of people oh, yes, in sure. both out-of-body experience and in the uh, uses of the bioenergy, the conscious working with the, with the bioenergy. Have your students been able to do some of these things? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And even some of them were part of some of these uh, experiments that I have done, yeah. but at least to their you know, the way they relate or they report, they say that they were able many times to help someone to, to take away the pain of someone, to help their plants or even pets. Many times people have some health problems or some challenges and working with energy, they could overcome that. Many times, for instance, pain, many times uh, with the difficulty to fall asleep, Mm -hmm. Even many times with psychological challenges, anxiety, depression, it is interesting how these things can be so effective. It's a pity that our um, medicine is still, you know, it's so skeptical about these things yeah. because, because there is basically no risk. The, the worst that could happen for a person is to quiet down, mm -hmm. to close the eyes and to relax for a bit. But in a way, we can achieve a lot more than just that. And uh, as I said before, a lot of people who were not sensitive to energy, they had never heard about it. After some training, learning, they can develop their own abilities. Usually, most of the people feel first the ability 
to sense energy. After a while, they can really control that. So with time, you can control the intensity of the energy you can project. You can control the rhythm. You can control the kind of information you try to transfer to someone. Because suppose if someone is very depressed, and then when we emit energy, we want to see if we can give more motivation, more um, optimism to that person, if you can drive the person to be more vitalized. Mm -hmm. But if someone is already very agitated, very anxious, perhaps we should do the opposite. It's calming the person, quieting down. So the kind of information we put in the energy is very, very important there. But in my experiments, I think we are still far from this point of detecting the information mm -hmm. in the energy. Now, up to this moment, it's being more like a quant quantitative analysis, how much energy we are pumping there. But the way I see is in the future, we are going to have a way of measuring this energy, not only detecting if it is there or not, but having a proportional measure of uh, the power of the energy. And I think we will be able to give it a kind of unit for, to, for measurement, like uh, you know, volts, mm -hmm. like uh, lumens. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to create this to have a scale. So then we will be able to really to do more research on that, when we can attribute, give numbers to this reality. Well, I'm pretty sure even though medicine and, and science has a very hard time dealing with, with this energy because uh, although your experiments with the fMRI seem quite impressive for the most part, scientists are – they don't know about this. Sure. It's, it's not as if you've been published in the Journal of Physics or, or, or something. But in martial arts traditions, in yoga traditions, in acupuncture traditions, in many healing traditions, there are, I guess I would call them lineages or um, lore of one kind or another, sometimes going back hundreds, thousands of, yeah. of yeah. years. Uh, the people have been working with this energy you know, regardless of what the scientists think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is interesting that this is, as you said, very ancient, has been part of the human culture for so long. But for a long while, there was a big, how can I say, deep reaction, like a kind of um, denial of this. Mm -hmm. So perhaps now we can feel, see this more mm -hmm. as a common thing. Mm -hmm. But it's not only with um, medicine, uh, but for instance, in physics. By the way, it's interesting that when I show the results of my research to many different people, the physicists are most of the time more open to this than the medical doctors. They have a more open yeah. mind to this. Mm -hmm. And even I went to a course in Brazil many years ago for a kind of specialization in function MRI. So I was in a university with this, you know, very knowledgeable people in this area with uh, teachers, professors from different areas there. Those guys, when they saw my results, they got very impressed by that. Mm -hmm. They didn't think it was just because of some fluke, the acquisition of information that was just a kind of, a, you know, artifact, as they say. Yeah. So when you re really talk to people who understand deeply the process there, they get really curious about that. So we should go further on that. I had to stop this for a while because of the COVID sure. problem. Nobody could leave their homes. They could not travel. But now I intend to get back to that. I have an opportunity to pro pro uh, probably in Paris, in France, to get another machine there to run more experiments. And I will try to narrow this to a much specific uh, kind of uh, experiment because I was trying something very broad. Yes. I was using the water and the egg and my brain, other people there, because it was being more like exploratory mm -hmm. to see my way around. But now I think we can go much further there. But there, uh, there is something that I didn't put there in that TEDx, that TEDx presentation that I showed you. In one of these experiments, I put a friend inside of the machine instead of the egg. Mm -hmm. And I asked him just to relax and wait. Without telling him there, while the machine was working, during one per particular moment there, like the egg, I start transmitting energies to his head without his previous knowledge of that. The same effect that happened in the egg happened there. Oh. Nothing the first, third, 
when I send energy there, a lot of lights in many parts of his brain. Mm -hmm. When I stop, this influence reduced again. And he's inside the MRI machine. Is They're it? very noisy. They are very noisy, very claustrophobic. Yeah. So in some of these experiments, the sessions, I had to stay inside of these machines for hours. Oh. My record, I think it was three hours and a half. Session after session mm -hmm. after session. Because once you move, once you get out of the machine, you have to run the first steps of the procedure, the protocol there again. It can take a long time to get the image of the brain and so on. Mm. But anyway, all in name of science. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a pioneer. You're looking at areas of energy that many scientists think cannot possibly exist. They don't even know they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and But not only do you research it, you train people to work with this energy. And uh, I've had a conversation with Nancy Trivellato, who uh, has demonstrated enormous subtlety in her understanding of all of the nuances of how we work with energy. Most people don't even have the words to describe it's this. It's true. So that's why many times we are forced to create new words. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we, st we start feeling energy and we see this in our training with our students, at the beginning we are very, how could I say, imprecise, very coarse with mm -hmm. our perceptions. We sense a bit, but then we don't. But little by little, it's like our palate, it's like our ability to smell things. A lot of people can, for instance, drink, um, let me say, coffee, mm -hmm. and they can say, oh, this is Arabic, or this is Robusta, and this is from Ethiopia, this is from Colombia, this is from Highland, whatever. Mm -hmm. I can only say if it is good or not. Official tasters. Exactly. Yeah. So you see how much people can practice to be able to distinguish nuances, you know, and the resolution of uh, the differences of sensations get, you know, higher and higher with training. Mm -hmm. We follow exactly the same idea with energy. So in our training, for instance, we try to show people, look, try to feel energy from the earth, from the geological formations here. And we train people to see if they can give names to that. Oh, this energy is like warmer. Is like thick. It moves like molasses. So analogies at the beginning. And then we tell people, try to feel energy from the air, from the atmosphere. And then what do you feel? Oh, this energy is more like sparky, is faster, is colder. Again, it's like kids, mm -hmm. you know, trying to describe something, but we get better and better. And then we tell them, try to feel energy from the trees, from water. So by contrasting, comparing, People get better and better. It's like, for instance, we were talking about coffee, how some of these connoisseurs got there to that point. Tasting and drinking a lot of coffees from many different sources. Mm -hmm. So if we try you no know, different coffees from many different uh, you know, coffee beans, different points of roasting them, we can compare, we can contrast them, we can even create a scale. Mm -hmm. Is even let the, let us think of something simpler. Suppose if we were trying to classify the different tastes of different varieties of apple, mm -hmm. let us create a sequence here of uh, how sweet they are, another scale of how acidic they are, you know, of other different subtleties of the flavor there. So we cannot say there is just one flavor for apple. You can taste ten different varieties. With time, you can even distinguish them. It's the same thing with energy. Mm -hmm. These things take time. They take some dedication, some attention. But once you start feeling this, this catches your curiosity. You want, you want to know more and more. And then you want to explore different trees and places. Like, for instance, I lived in Miami for many years. I noticed there that the earth energy is not so powerful, mm -hmm. but the air energy from the climate, the, the sky, the meteorological phenomena there is really very powerful. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, Ness and I went to Hawaii, big island. We went there to feel the volcano there. And the geoenergy there is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Sometimes even not paying attention to that. You could feel this thing flowing up your legs like 
if you had to step on a ant's nest, this thing <laughs> crawling up tingle. your leg, tingle, yeah. very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are walking on the street and then you pa pass under a tree, you are not paying attention to that, and you feel these pleasant shivers coming down through you. You look around, oh yes, I am under the tree. This tree is very powerful. In the past, humanity was a lot more in touch with nature. We were living with nature as farmers or whatever. But as it is obvious, we are getting farther and farther away from nature. Now living in big cities, in concrete buildings, people have less chance not only to feel, but even to get the benefits of this energy. And I think this is against our health. How many people say, oh, I feel so much better when I go hiking, walking, you know, in the woods, I go up the mountains, when I dive, for instance, because diving is something incredible because of that amount of energy you feel from the water. Mm -hmm. So it's a pity that people are not taking advantage of so many different sources of bioenergy. And with the destruction of our ecosystem. I don't know how much we are going to lose from that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, this is not going to change so much the energy from the planet per se, the geological mm -hmm. energy, but from lakes, streams, rivers, from the plants, forests, yes, we can lose a lot there. All of what you've been describing is sensitivity to the energy, the ability to perceive it. Then we, we've talked about the ability to, to control it through thought. Yes. And earlier, you began by saying you had an out-of-body experience at the age of nine. That's yes. what provoked your journey. Exactly. And I gather that you've learned that by Working with this energy, people can consciously learn to engender out-of-body experiences. Exactly. My first experience started when I was young with lucid dreams. I have always been a big dreamer, dreaming every night. When I say this, remembering my dreams, mm. because we, we all dream every night. But I always had big dreams whole adventures and stories. For me, it was amazing when people would say, look, you know what? I don't remember my dreams. Mm -hmm. And some people would say, do you dream in color or black and white? And I say, what kind of question is that? Of course, we dream in color. So for me, dreaming was like living another life. Mm -hmm. I used to enjoy that. But then one day, I was having one of these dreams, of course, and I noticed that things were incoherent during the dream. My house is not like that. This doesn't make sense. Then I thought, what is going on here? I thought, I might be dreaming. This has to be a dream. And then I thought, look, if I wake up in my bed, if this whole dream disappears here, I will prove to myself that I am dreaming. So I concentrated, and then I woke up in my bed. So, big yuppie there. <laughs> I thought, yes, I was dreaming. So this helped me to have other you know, lucid dreams. But then instead of trying to wake up, I thought, for instance, I could change the dream. I could change the whole story. So I start playing with a kind of, a, kind of a, you know, virtual reality of mine. I could change the whole sequence there. But then one day after some time, when I tried to wake up, instead of waking up inside of my body, opening the physical eyes, I woke up floating outside of my body. The dream disappeared, and I saw myself floating in my bedroom, my brother sleeping on the other bed, and then I thought, what is this? I thought, this is not the super dream. My name as a kid for lucid dreams. Mm. I used to call them super dreams uh -huh. instead of lucid dream because I didn't know this expression. Mm. And then I thought, this is different. This is something completely different. And then I woke up, I came back to my physical body, because of the surprise. But then for me, it was very clear to see the difference between a dream, mm -hmm. a lucid dream, and a full lucid out of body experience. I remember once I went to the front, to the, to the street in front of my house there. There was a bus stop. I could see a group of people there waiting for the bus in the morning. I could see them, how many, their clothes. I returned to my physical body and I went back there walking with the physical body, and I saw the same group of people there, exactly as I saw. So that wasn't a dream. And then with the development of this, I started having these spontaneous vibrational states. 
So this powerful, like having a kind of a high voltage, electricity passing through us, through you. But it's not, it wasn't a painful or unpleasant thing. It was really powerful there. But I didn't know how to provoke this state. It took me years. I think about a decade mm -hmm. until I could start finding books about that. And Robert Monroe was the first that I saw there. Oh, I had vibrational state when I was trying to leave my body. And then he had a particular technique mm -hmm. to get the vibrational state. And then contacting mediums, psychic people, Valdo Vieira and others, mm -hmm. I noticed that we could provoke this kind of state. So we perfected the technique that nowadays we call Velo, as Nancy wrote in her book, yes. of moving energy under our control, inside of our body, little by little. But it's not something that we just imagine. It's not a visualization. It's a real thing, like moving our hand. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, as we don't feel, it is mostly like thinking about it. But little by little, you feel something rushing inside of your body. Mm -hmm. So this gets faster and faster with time, with training, until you trigger that kind of resonance, exactly what we call the vibrational state. Yes. This willful, conscious control of the energy is the best way we know to provoke an out-of-body experience. And it helps us because you leave the body conscious during the transition. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they are trying to leave the body, they are lucid inside of the body. During the transition, they have what we call a blackout, so you lose lucidity. Mm -hmm. You wake up already somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere else. Most of the people don't feel the process of really getting out of the body. And it is one of the most amazing things. It's like if you were undressing your physical body. Like if you were getting the body out of you. Mm -hmm. And you can be as lucid as you are here right now. Sometimes even more lucid than we are here. In some of these out-of-body experiences, we have a kind of a expansion of consciousness. Like a cosmic consciousness, as we like mm -hmm. to say. And you've actually trained thousands of people. Thousands of people, yes. What percentage are able to leave their body? During our classes, during yeah. their activity, between 10 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Some other people, they achieve this later on. Yeah. A lot of people never tell us later if they got the OBEs or not. We cannot really go behind them, you know, trying to follow them. But some people, they say, you know, Wagner, I had the courses with you a few years ago. I dropped this for a while. But when I just got back, resumed the training, I got my OBEs. Mm -hmm. Because OBEs, they depend on a lot of different factors also. If the person, for instance, too stressed with a lot of worries, facing some problems, it's more difficult for the person to have the OBEs. Yeah. It's not impossible. But... It and so harder. many people are under stress. Exactly. Nowadays, of course. Yeah. Well, one big problem is um, people many times do not sleep well. Mm -hmm. So for most of the people, a deeper relaxation helps a lot leaving the body. Mm -hmm. So most of the people don't relax well deeply when they leave the body. For other people, is just falling asleep so quickly they don't even have the time to really try to trigger, to get back this kind of extra physical lucidity. But once you start this, there is endless you know, possibilities for that. How many things we can do with, with an OBE? Many times people ask us, well, well, if this is possible, why should I apply effort and time and training on that? What are the benefits of that? Mm -hmm. Look, first of all, for me, is just a way of exploring other side of reality. You know, a deeper, much deeper reality. Mm -hmm. What do we see with our senses is just a, a very thin, you know, layer of the reality. Yeah. There is a lot more there. We, dis we discover more about ourselves. If you think of all the benefits some people get with their near-death experiences, we can get the very same benefits, overcoming the fear of death, getting a much more, how could they say, conscious, responsible way of seeing our life, like mm -hmm. feeling we have a purpose, a mission in this life, we can be much more helpful to other people. So there is a big life that, that expands on us. Mm -hmm. Besides technical things, we can go to any place, we can go to the, to the outer space. I can only imagine, many times we discuss this, how every and each science could be expanded with the autobot experience. Mm -hmm.
Well, I would think the temptation is for people to figure out how can I get rich? Can can I uh, find out you know what what stocks are going to move sure. or, or, <laughs> or, or or something like that? And my sense is that. It can be done. It can be done, but but it's very tricky because of the emotional uh, attachments uh, exactly. to 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 money, to physical things. It can, uh, it can throw people off balance. It's true, but one way many times I tell people to think about this is: as we leave the body, we learn so many things. We can improve our creativity. Mm -hmm. How many ideas yeah. can we get out of the body? So when we study a little bit about dreams, we know that some people got inspiration for scientific discoveries, inventions, when they were dreaming. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, the invention of the sewing machine, uh, the in chemical, in organic chemistry, the benzene, benzene the kekole, you know, like benzene. the Oroburu. Yeah. So, so many things. There is a long list of things yeah. people got in this altered state of consciousness that is dream. Even more when we leave the body. Mm -hmm. Imagine, as I was describing, so many different forms of uh, paratechnology. Mm -hmm. Another new name, but I think it's self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Technology of other dimensions. If we could bring some of these inspirations back to create new things and new devices here. So there is even a possibility of getting rich there. But it's not what we focus on the most. We think, look, can we improve life, the quality of life for us and everyone and everybody? We have to have enough to have a decent life. But in my case, I don't worry about getting rich because what is the point of that? I want to have a rich life, yeah. a rich set of experience. Well, it certainly sounds like you do. <laughs> I, I think I do, yes, yeah. yes. I have a, I have a pretty... Exciting life. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's exciting what you're doing with the International Academy of Consciousness. I, I think your work is very advanced and not well enough known sure. in the English speaking world. It should be more well known. I hope this video awakens a lot of people to what you this. are doing there in Portugal. Yes, and people can come for our courses. We have the basic training online, so this mm -hmm. is streaming. So people can watch this in any place in the world, any time, all at once in a marathon or little by little. And once they get this first level of training, so they can, they can engage in deeper training, even going there to the campus, using our labs. We have, for instance, one lab for people to feel the energy of a tree because a tree house. We have another one that facilitates the vibration state, mm -hmm. another one for leaving the body. Mm -hmm. I suppose most of the people know the cerebro from the X-Men, that holy sphere, and there is a platform in the oh, middle. Yeah. We built that before <laughs> the movie, so ours is a big sphere, mm -hmm. complete sphere, with a platform in the middle, so it has the right conditions there for us to leave the body. And one of our labs there is to facilitate the expansion of consciousness. Mm -hmm. What people call samadhi, satori, nirvana, union mystic, uh, uh, oceanic consciousness. And again, a long list of synonyms because there are so many expressions that we, as we were discussing before, it's difficult to create a kind of dictionary for all these analogies there. Well, Wagner, Allegretti, I would say your work is extremely Thank advanced. You. I appreciate it. That. Is uh, precise. It, uh, it is deep. You have decades of experience behind you. I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of my colleagues, parapsychological associates in the United States would benefit from uh, learning more about your work. I want to thank you thank so you much much. for being my with pleasure. me today. My pleasure. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. It's because of you that we are here.
We just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.